Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Phil Mackesy. Marin Katusa is our go-to guy for energy. He's chief energy investment strategist at Casey Research, and he's senior editor of the Casey Energy Report. He is online at CaseyResearch.com. Hey, Marin, it's good to have you back on This Week in Money again. It's a pleasure to be back. Let's look at the news. Oil prices slumping this week. Stronger U.S. dollar pulling the price from 96 to below 94 bucks a barrel. We also have some supply and demand worries here. As always, uh, here's OPEC uh, saying demand grew less than expected in the first quarter. And the Energy Information Administration from the U.S. says a rise in crude supplies much less than expected. And that, of course, is whipsawing the price of oil back and forth. What do you see? Well, it's exactly uh, new production is not easy to bring online. And the price is staying where it is because costs around the world have increased significantly. You're also going to see an announcement in the future. PDVSA, the PDVSA, the Mexican national oil company, is coming out saying, uh, or sorry, the Venezuelans and Pemex, the Mexican oil petroleum company, are saying uh, we need help, and they're looking for foreign technology to increase production. So not just the Venezuelans, but also the Mexicans, which have amazing world-class oil fields, are struggling, and their oil production is decreasing. So around the world, not just OPEC countries, but the costs everywhere are increasing. Marin Katusa from KC Energy Report with us here on This Week in Money. Other news today, U.S. oil exports reaching the highest level in 28 years as deliveries to, guess what, Canada more than tripled. Uh, that's helping bring down the uh, differential, the premium of uh, Brent over WTI, narrowing to 8 bucks a barrel this week, Marin, from uh, 25 in November. It's a big jump. Well, the refineries have uh, tr- transitioned because, remember, every year they got to have downtime for maintenance. So that's part of the reason. The reality is, is as we'll get into later with the bet with Porter, costs of shale are not what people thought they would be. The decline rates are significant, and it's like running on a treadmill. You've got to keep drilling to keep producing. Something we've covered before, Marin, the uh, difference between uh, America and Canada. Not such a good deal for Canadian crude producers, getting almost 30 bucks a barrel less than the WTI. Well, exactly. And, uh, you know, that's why eventually you'll see in 15, 20 years, there'll be the pipeline to the south with the Keystone XL. You're going to see the northern gateway eventually in some form be done to bring the oil to the west. And you'll also see more pipelines to the east. And that's what's going to happen to free the Canadian heavy oil. And will there be a refinery built in B.C.? I think one day there will be. I think all these things have to happen because... Canadians annually are losing over $30 billion a year just solely depending on the Americans. We've got some news from the uh, oil majors also this week, Marin. Shell and Exxon, both in the news. Shell says they're going to develop the world's deepest offshore oil and gas production facility, uh, two miles deep in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, the one day after ExxonMobil said it would be starting a $4 billion project. They're going to develop the Julia oil field. That's also in the Gulf of Mexico. So things are jumping down there. Well, they're jumping, but they're really deep and high-cost production. So if a, com- a company like Shell or Exxon, which are you know the super majors, they are realizing, that's confirming exactly what we're talking about, that the cheap oil is gone, and they got to go deeper and more expensive and in harsher terrain than ever before to keep the production going. Marin Katusa, our guest here on This Week in Money. Uh, tell me for a second what's going on here with this free Casey Research webinar. It's called The Myth of American Energy Independence. Looks interesting. Tell me about it. Sure. For a year, we've been writing about how, you know, all these reports coming out of the EIA saying that America is going to become energy independent. I went through the 300 plus page report using their own data saying that this is illogical. And uh, I wrote that this is not true. I went through it fact by fact, page by page, and we wrote what was wrong with the report. That caused a big stir in the, in, the, in the energy sector, and that caught the attention of some major players. So I went and put together a webinar where we have the Secretary of Energy of America, uh, Secretary Spencer Abraham. We have uh, the Honorable Herb Dollywall, who is Canada's energy minister. Uh, we have the UK Authority uh, for Nuclear Energy, Uh, Lady Barbara Judge on, and all three are coming out confirming what we are said in our report that this is a myth, America is in big trouble, and basically it's focusing on 
the greatest investment in the energy sector today. It's the cheapest way to profit from the coming energy crisis. And that would be nuclear. Without a doubt, nuclear is a solution that not just America is depending on in China, but countries like Saudi Arabia, UAE, France, Britain. Even the Germans are starting to rumble that they're going to have to go back to their nuclear. And Japan's already come out. You know, the two greatest nuclear issues, you have the nuclear bomb in Japan and the Fukushima disaster, and they come on and said, we have no choice but bring these nukes back Mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So the webinar is May 21st. That's next week at uh, 2 Eastern. How do I find out more uh, details? It's a free webinar with some of the world's greatest uh, and knowledgeable experts in this field, and it's free. You go onto the site, and you just type in your email, and you get a link, and you watch it live. All right. Uh, a year ago, Marin, you made a bet on uh, on oil with uh, Porter Stansbury from uh, stansburyresearch.com. A hundred ounces of silver, and you're saying it's one of the easiest bets you've ever made. Even if silver's uh, fallen, uh, five bucks an ounce looks looks like you're well on the way here. Uh, and Porter said oil would fall below 40 bucks a barrel, and you said there is no freaking way that's going to happen. We are seeing less supply, more demand, and costs are going up. Well, Porter is a very close friend. He's probably one of the most interesting people I know. He's a he's a riot to hang out with. He's a great guy, and he, he's a fantastic commentator on the markets. And he was at a Casey conference. He gave a phenomenal talk about why oil is going to go down to $40. And he startled so many people. He created such a stir at the conference that everybody was coming up to me and going, Marin, what are we going to do? So I went up during my talk, and I said, guys, Porter's great. He's a great talker. He's a smart guy. He's a buddy of mine. But I'll tell you what, there's no chance in hell that oil is going under $40. I'm going to put my money where my mouth is. Porter, I challenge you to 100 ounces of silver. He took the bet. We fast forward a year. I won the bet. And, you know, it comes down to what we're talking about in our report, in the webinar. The reality is, is that even with the success of the shale oil and shale gas, the reality is, is, The cheap oil is gone. Now, Porter has some great points that he talks about, but unfortunately the decline rates and the cost of drilling and the cost of labor and the cost of equipment, the cost of recycling the water, they're getting to the point where these unconventional technologies are increasing production, but the cost of that production is still expensive. And that comes down to my argument that the cheap oil is gone. Now, one of Porter's main points here was about the worldwide shale oil revolution, that it would push prices down. And maybe he's right, but that's not going to happen anytime soon. Well, you know, first of all, the the fracking technology has been around for a while. And America's had a huge head start on, on the unconventional technologies. It's taken America 20 years to get to where they are. In Europe, there's been one successful company... Casey Research was the first company to write a research report on the potential of the European shales. We got it right. The company we picked made a lot of money, a seven-bagger in a bad market. You know, making 700% gains in a bad market is good. That's outstanding. The reality is, is Europe is 20 years behind. There's not enough fracking equipment. There's not enough uh, the permits to get the permits to drill the fracks. It's difficult. The, the, the pipeline infrastructure, the... The, the, the setup, the know-how, it's going to take time. And, you know, America's had a 20-year head start. The rest of the world's just starting. And that's where Porter got it wrong. Okay. We also have a list here of the top 10 reasons you feel uh, high oil prices are here to stay, even though it dropped two bucks this week and everybody's calling for lower prices. We are looking at some fundamentals here that say it's going the other way. Let's start with uh, your first reason, uh, declining production. Well, exactly. You know, you, you, you have decline rates. Everybody's talking about how the oil shale is going to solve the world. These decline rates are greater than 50% in the first year. And then every year on there, it goes between 15 to 25% uh, uh, decline rate. So that means if you start with 1,000 barrels of oil production, which is a super well, remember, that, that, that may not sound like a lot of oil, considering that 80, around, you know, 83 million is used a day, but that's a massively successful well. It's just a thousand barrels a day. Wow. At the end of the year, you're lucky to have four or five hundred barrels. Then the next year, it's down to three hundred barrels. Then two hundred barrels. So it's like running on a treadmill. You got to keep drilling to keep that production going. So every year, you got to drill one well to replace the decline of the well before it. 
those costs are increasing. You also mentioned an interesting technical angle here that the more oil you pump out of a well, the less pressure there is, the harder it is to pump what's left. Exactly. So if you look at the great deposits like Guajar or, or the Cantorell Basin, they are pumping so much water into these uh, reservoirs And then eventually you may have a potential density difference. It gets into the engineering of it because the density of oil is different than the density of water. And they're pumping up so much water into these reservoirs to keep the pressures going. Then what happens if there's a collapse? It's happened before. And nobody's talking about the potential black swan of what would happen if an engineering mistake happened and they didn't pump in enough water or they pumped in too much water and then that reservoir collapses and production seizes. Amazing stat here, Marin, from your piece. Uh, Venezuela, fuel prices, 18 cents a gallon. And, and people are upset because that's up from 5 cents a gallon just a year ago. <laughs> it, it, exactly. <laughs> oh, when I was man. in Kuwait with Doug and in Iraq, when we were down in South America, these are all subsidized gasoline prices. And PDVSA, PDVSA is having a huge issue because, you know, their production is decreasing domestically, but yet they They've subsidized the local demand that people are complaining from 5 to 18. What happens if it went to 50 cents? So there's only so much oil that they can sell to the Americans. Remember, the Americans buy a million barrels of Venezuelan oil a day, but their production in Venezuela is decreasing. So they got to now, because they're exporting less, because they have the local demand, they got to sell it for a higher price. So there's a lot of issues there. We're talking to Marin Katusa from Casey Energy Report here on This Week in Money. Interesting when you say, according to your analysis, OPEC needs the price of oil to stay over 60 bucks a barrel uh, for exactly the reasons you pointed out. They're paying for a lot of things. Oh, of course. And this is a, we spent a lot of time going through the annual budgets of every country in OPEC. And we realized that, you know, 50 percent uh, of, of all of the revenue is not going back into, you know, drilling more wells to sustain production, bringing in unconventional technologies. It's paying for social programs. And they're not reinvesting into their fields the way the super majors have to to sustain their production. So look at Indonesia. Indonesia used to be an OPEC. It's no longer an OPEC. Why? Because it's planning on becoming a net importer, not a net exporter. Venezuela, uh, Mexico, they're all looking at not becoming net exporters. They're now potentially looking at an issue where they might become a net importer of energy. These are serious problems yeah, yeah. for the countries. Marin, what about the difference between natural gas and oil? We tend to lump them together, but they behave very differently. Uh, they're a very, very different commodity. Uh, first of all, natural gas is a very localized market. Hence why in Japan they're paying $17 per MCF, but down in certain areas in the U.S. they're paying two and a half, three dollars per MCF. LNG is trying to bridge that gap, but the reality is, is that's a much different game. But natural gas, even within the U.S., is priced differently, uh, never mind globally, whereas oil is priced on a more global standpoint. Natural gas, kind of at the center of one of uh, Porter's arguments about the price of oil falling. Uh, He says it's going to go down because all this natural gas is going to be wonderful. It's going to provide an alternative fuel. And, of course, that's going to drive oil prices down. Is he right? Is he wrong? Uh, His time frame was wrong. You know, I had lunch with T. Boone Pickens, who's a legend Mm -hmm. in the oil business. And his whole argument was that about 5 or 6% of all the trucks on the road are those long-haul 18-wheelers, cross-country, you know, shipping trucks. And... He's right, but it's going to take a long time to get that. And that, that, those trucks, which only make up 5% of the vehicles, consume about a third of the gasoline in the country. And he says, well, if we just replace those with CNG, uh, compressed natural gas, which is a Canadian technology, by the way. I like to point that out to all the Americans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the point is, is that in theory it makes sense, but these long-haul trucks, the infrastructure it would cost, to replace these gas stations with CNG yeah. is going to cost billions of dollars. And I'm not saying it's not going to happen. What I'm saying is it takes a lot longer to get permits and to develop things and finance things than the market wants to wait. So where Porter was wrong was on his timing. In terms of demand, also, uh, oil is in a zillion things. What, what do you make out of natural gas besides more gas? Well, you get into the fertilizers, where, but natural uh, oil is much more of a versatile commodity where they make the plastics and nylons and even medicine, believe it or not. I spent a lot of time at the medicines lately, and uh, one thing you'd be shocked is the petroleum products are in every aspect of our lives. 
Marin, lots of talk uh, in the financial media about the shale revolution, how it's going to change everything. Uh, but you point out here, and I think it's a really good point that we should think about. We should talk about this. It is really something that's confined to North America. Well, right now it is. And, you know, the first company that completed a shale oil uh, or a, a shale well in Europe was a company that Casey Research recommended. It was a massively successful well, but it was a $12 million well. And what people have to realize is that there have been so few shale wells drilled in Europe. And Europe is well ahead of Africa and Asia mm -hmm. and Russia and all of South America. And globally, we're just starting this unconventional technology. You see, we call it unconventional because it's, it seems different than the conventional. But now in America, we're, we're touching almost the point where unconventional is conventional. Yeah. It's, it's the normal way to go about it because they're getting the oil from the tight rock. That's normal in America. It's very uncommon in the rest of the world. And it's going to take 25 to 50 years before the rest of the world catches up to where America is. And that's where everybody in the media is getting this wrong because they don't actually finance and work in these companies and execute yeah. these drill programs, they just look at it on paper and see, well, if America did it, the rest of the world did it, but Africa doesn't have the existing pipelines. They don't have the existing infrastructure that the American oil patch has, and that's what they're missing here. Yeah, it's one thing to drill this stuff, but how are you going to get it to market? Exactly, and, and, and never mind, how are you going to get permits in Europe or South America? You know, that's another thing. Uh, New Zealand is having their first ever... A shale well drilled in a right now it's just happening so think about that their first is happening now it's just starting one of the things that surprises me when we're talking technically about shale wells that i never realized before uh, it seems like the holy grail it's going to be the, the solution here but this is amazing technically speaking shale wells decline by more than 50 percent after their first year wow and not only that every single shale well needs between two to five million gallons of water think about how wow. much water because you gotta you gotta frack that rock so think about how much pressure and how much water has to be injected and nobody is talking about wait a second um where are we going to get all that water from it's already in the ground but uh we're going to be arguing with farmers and, and other people who who want to use the water right exactly yeah. and there's a cost to all that which means higher oil costs we're talking to Marin Katusa from Casey Energy Report here on This Week in Money. We're talking about his bet uh, with Porter Stansbury. Porter says the price of oil going down below 40. Marin says no way. One of the big reasons uh, that uh, Marin was uh, talking about earlier, a falling oil price uh, means that a huge chunk of uh, what we're looking at in reserves just simply won't be worth drilling for. Well, exactly. Let's take the Canadian oil sands. You know, that is the ho uh, holy grail of oil deposits. Yeah. People forget how much oil Canada has, but again, it's unconventional production. If oil was to go to $40, 80% of the existing production, you can stop it. Never mind any more new production. The reality is, is the cost of production in Canada Nobody can make money at $40. We're talking to Marin Katusa here on This Week in Money. And uh, your ninth reason that oil prices are not going to fall is something that uh, we don't often think about. There's a lot of byproducts that, uh, that come out of gas wells, for example. Well, exactly, and the oil wells. So all of these factors are, there, there's a demand for this oil. And whether you get the dilutants from it, even from the natural gas, you get your pentanes and butanes, uh, all these different factors, it's all about the carbon chains, and the chemists come up with millions of ways to use this, from computers to iPhones to iPads to medicine to, to all sorts of products in your car you don't even realize. So the reality is it's not just, you know, used for gasoline or airplanes. Mm -hmm. This is an everyday in our life. and People forget that. Where do plastics come from? Oil. Exactly. One of the things we have not talked about that it's, uh, that's kind of a, a, a very impactful on what's happening with, uh, with oil and natural gas, something that's hard to predict, and those are black swan events, stuff that just comes out of nowhere. Oh, exactly. Let's say a civil war. Let's say an Arab Spring. Let's say uh, the Strait of Hormuz shuts down where a third of the Middle East oil production goes through. If Israel happens, anything with Iran. What about what I talked about earlier about the 
pumping of water into major fields like Guajar? What happens if there's an engineering mistake in a, in a well concave? What about the Macondo well in the Gulf of Mexico where there's the massive oil spill? You know, just, just to put it in perspective, Phil, I want you to remember the disaster in the summer of 2010 in the Gulf of Mexico mm-hmm. with BP? It was front page news everywhere in the world, right? Do you realize that if you got every drop of oil out of that well, it would make up less than 12 hours of the global demand of oil. Amazing. That whole well, first of all, you're never going to get all of the oil out of a well because you'd have to bring in EOR, enhanced oil recoveries. You're lucky to get about 65% of the oil out over many, many, many years. But let's just say hypothetically, that one oil well, which is costing BP $100 billion, makes up less than 12 hours of the oil that the world would consume. If you took all that oil and spat it into the system, it'd be consumed before lunch. Wow. Just That's amazing. what I'm trying to explain to people is how difficult the new production to replace the old, easy production, it's not cheap. It's expensive. It's going deeper. It's riskier. It's in harsher climates. That's why I made the bet with Porter, and that's why I also asked him to shine the, the silver for me before he gives it to me. <laughs> Make sure you let us know when the uh, when you guys should collect your silver from you, would you? It's actually going to be, uh, I'm heading out to one of his conferences to give a talk to his people, and he's going to provide the 100 ounces there, so it's at the end of May. <laughs> We're going to watch for that. Marin Katusa, Chief Energy Investment Strategist at Casey Research. He's online at CaseyResearch.com. The uh, Casey folks also on Twitter and Facebook. And don't forget the free Casey Research webinar, The Myth of American Energy Independence. Is nuclear the ultimate contrarian investment that's may 21st at two eastern and more details at uh, caseyresearch.com hey Marin, thanks for your time my friend always a pleasure with you phil take care this week in money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com it's always great to get a chance to talk to mike shedlock from global economic analysis.blogspot.com if you have not yet bookmarked his site please do so uh just google mish you're going to be glad you did let's start off mish in asia a big move for the yen and, and then we're going to talk about this new japanese bra but first let's talk about the big move in the forex markets today what happened um a lot of stuff i mean no real impetus that i could find I mean, there's various rumors swirling around there's rumors every day actually here but uh, just more ab- abonomics, I guess. Uh, the yen broke through the um, uh, $1 barrier uh, versus the U.S. dollar, and uh, uh, my gosh, it was over a 30% move hmm. in, in uh, the last half year or so here that the yen has fallen from 131 down to 1 so uh, versus the U.S. dollar. And uh, the Australian dollar took a big hit today. The euro was down. The the uh, U.S. dollar was up, and um, along with the plunging in, the Nikkei has been on a freaking tear. Wow! And that's one of the trades uh, I that I like. I uh, most of my readers know that I like gold, and gold has not been cooperating. <laughs> but uh, the um, trade in Japanese equities that I like is long Japanese equities and short the yen. And uh, both sides of that trade has been a winner. And as long as the yen keeps falling, the Nikkei is probably going to rise. But bear in mind, I, I'm i predicting a very bad end for this for Japan. There are uh, uh, struggling to try and reach a 2% inflation rate, and when they get there, I don't think it's going to stop there, Phil. Now, what's making the yen fall, and who can take the credit for it, if any credit is to be taken for all this? Well, they're they're printing money like mad. The central bank has, has um, replaced Bank of Japan governors with, with those that want to print the yen, with those that want to cause inflation. And so, you know, here we are, and the markets are cheering, I'm not sure that it's done all that much for Japanese corporate profits. I, exports are up a little bit here, but um, look at the bad side. All the energy, and Japan is totally dependent on um, importing energy. Mm-hmm. So energy costs have gone up. F- food costs that they import, and Japan grows very little of its own food except for rice, and they probably ought to import that too. Uh, so 
it's certainly a bad deal for the Japanese consumer. You know, perhaps it's a good deal for exporters. It's a very bad deal for Japanese importers and a very bad deal for the Japanese consumers and a very bad deal for the nation as a whole, is the way I see it. So we're going to see a uh, currency crisis of, of some sort over this at some point. And uh, Japan's a likely place to look. Good news for Japanese consumers, of course, the Abenomics bra. <laughs> Tell me about this story. <laughs> well, they're not selling this thing, but uh, this is kind of a spoof. A, a uh, Japanese division of a lingerie maker uh, called Triumph International unveiled on Wednesday a new Abenomics bra and a special <laughs> co- collection offering a growth strategy with a potential uplift oh, man. <laughs> for <laughs> the uh, Japan's elusive inflation target. Target. We hope that as the Japan economy grows, we can also help bus sizes get bigger, <laughs> says Triumph's spokeswoman. Uh. So, um, hmm, you know, I, um, I color me skeptical. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, Phil. Keeps our mind off the falling yen, I guess. You know, we're uh, all... I, well, the falling yen is, is, is good for... Uh, rising inflation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, that's the goal here. The question is, uh, if they really get to their 2% that they want, it, first off, is it going to stop there? And then are they going to be happy with their choices? Uh, I think it's not going to stop there, and I think they're not going to be happy with their choices. We are all laughing about the uh, Shinzo Brahmish, but there is a dark side going on here. A story you, you've been highlighting this week, changes coming to the Japanese constitution, and not doesn't look very good here. No, it, it actually doesn't. And um, again, this is another part of Abenomics, where um, they are actually going back and praising some of these people that caused World War II uh, 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 from the Japanese side. And uh, they are proposing constitutional changes to allow Japan to be more militaristic. Hmm. Of course, China's up in arms over this. Korea's upset over this. Uh, uh, Singapore, you know, the various countries in the region are upset about this. And I'm just sit- sitting there uh, looking at the disputed islands in the South China Seas, wondering if and when Japan and China are going to get into it in a militaristic way over these barren islands in the sea that would otherwise be completely worthless and no one cared about until all of a sudden, um, a couple of years ago, they discovered some oil fields around uh, these islands. So um, now we've got a big to-do over who owns them. Mike Mishadlock is our guest here on This Week in Money. The other big news, uh, Mish, out of Asia this week, China's economy uh, is slowing down. That shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, the world economy is in recession generally. Uh, I, th- I think the world economy is in recession. No, it shouldn't surprise us, but but people seem to be surprised by this. The um, almost shocking news you know, out of Europe in terms of rising unemployment uh, 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 unemployment rates everywhere you look in France and in Italy and Spain, the number of people unemployed, and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And the IMF keeps coming out with these. Actually, they look at first glance pessimistic scenarios, but I look at these things and they're predicting, you know, a half a percent or something decline in 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 European GDP. And I said, my God, you know, these guys are way over optimistic. Mm-hmm. They just don't get it. The France is on a self-destruct mode. Slovenia is going to be the next country that's going to need a bailout here. And um, the the news there in Slovenia is a trifecta of stupidity. I called it on my blog today. They they, um, want to, they have a budget, budget mismatch similar to what we saw in Cyprus. And what they want to do about it is they want to, uh, hike that. They want to hike a tax on wages of up to 5%. Wow. My gosh. And uh, they also want to put a tax on properties. So we got a trifecta of tax hikes to so that they can bring their budget under control. My gosh, don't these people understand what those tax hikes are going to do to unemployment and the economy? Uh, Phil, I mean, I'm astounded here 
at how stupid this all is. I mean, this is what Greece went through. This is what Spain went through. It didn't work there. And they call this austerity. This isn't yeah. austerity. This is stupidity. If, if What they need to do is liberalize their work rules. They need to get rid of government bureaucrats. Instead, they're not doing any of that. Here's an amazing thing uh, today that I found on the on the internet. Twenty percent of Slovenian loans are non-performing, and get this: the largest banks in Slovenia are owned by the Slovenian government. Yeah. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. So 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 what are they going to do? So they're raising taxes here. To um, this is a bailout coming up and it's going to look like cyprus let's go from slovenia to slovenia with beaches and that would be spain they're in even worse shape than slovenia well it's a bigger hit on the eurozone economy if spain goes under and um there was an interesting article i think it was in the financial times as as uh, Spain goes, so goes Slovenia. Mm-hmm. I'm sitting here thinking, well, as Slovenia goes, so, so goes Spain. Because Slovenia is going to blow up first, and um, and Spain's going to follow for the same reasons. They don't get it. They're not doing the right things. And, of course, all the Keynesian clowns like um, uh, Paul Krugman are saying, <laughs> see, I told yeah. you so. But there's not one Austrian economist in the whole world that supports that these tax hikes in Spain, in Slovenia, in France, anywhere. Mike. Not a one. And, um, y- you know, yet they're calling that austerity. Yeah. Well, as I said, it's not austerity, it's stupidity. They, they need to be doing things to uh, free up rules and regulations to make it easier for businesses to hire and fire people. Businesses don't want to hire anyone in Europe right now um, because they have because they can't get rid of them once they hire them. Yeah. And it's it's a disaster in the making and it's getting worse and um I, you know, I don't know. Meanwhile, back in the United States, we've got hugely negative interest rates. And the Fed's trying to blow another property bill. Incredible. And uh, I looked to Canada, and I'm just wondering how long they can keep the bubble going there. We're seeing signs in Australia, The uh, uh, one of the currency moves today that I saw, the Australian dollar fell a couple cents versus the U.S. dollar. It's a pretty decent-sized currency move. And it came without a... Um, <laughs> a a bra of any kind from the prime minister being waved around and from good news, Australia. good news. So all of these things are just weighing around, yeah. and yet the stock markets globally have been levitating like mad. And I just wonder when the bubble is going to burst. And I wish I knew, but I don't. I just know that it's going to happen, and. Uh, the central bankers won this round, if you call blowing another bubble winning. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't think they win the next round. Mike Mish Shedlock, our guest here on This Week in Money. You can find him at globaleconomicanalysis.blogspot.com. And we're uh, kind of reviewing the stuff of, that you've been writing about this week, some interesting uh, topics. Ten days ago, you wrote uh, uh, something about the U.S. spending enough uh, on education. You raised a great point, uh, and you said, hey, you know, whatever the U.S. spends, how much of that money is for the kids, and how much goes somewhere else? Mostly the salaries and benefits. And you got a letter from uh, uh, Michael from Colorado who had some uh, pretty interesting figures in it. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he, he actually just took these publicly available figures that were uh, posted on a Colorado website, you know, talking about how much these superintendents and uh, principals and vice principals and everyone else was making in a particular Colorado district, and he compared that um, <laughs> to what Secretary of uh, State Hillary Clinton <laughs> makes, and, and guess what? All of these people, hundreds, uh, uh, make more than Hillary Clinton is making. And uh, so, you know, one really has to wonder, and they, of course, they always claim, and, I'm, and I, I bet they do in Canada as well, that it's for the kids. 
But it's not for the kids. You know, all of these tax hikes in, Co- in Colorado, this particular county passed two of them, uh, uh, two tax hikes. It's not for the kids. It's for the administrators. Sure, it's t- for the teachers. It's for the janitors. It's it's for you know all of the public unions that derive something from this. If uh, if fifteen percent of this money actually gets to the kids, I, I'd be surprised. Mike Meshedlock with us here on This Week in Money. And uh, we're going to jump back to Europe for a second here. If you don't know Nigel Farage, a great guy. Look him up on uh, YouTube. Founded the UK Independence Party. He's a member of the uh, European Parliament. The guy speaks his mind. And uh, it's sure fun to watch those bureaucrats cringe. You've got some Nigel Farage news you're talking about this week on the blog. I do. And um, I also saw another UKIP that's uh, uh, Godfrey Bloom blast fractional reserve lending. UKIP is the United Kingdom Independence Party. They support the idea that, as do I, that the UK ought to exit um, uh, the European Union, the, the EU. The, uh, they're not a member of the Eurozone, and they're probably thanking their lucky stars for that right now. But uh, they get nothing out of it but grief and all these EU regulations uh-huh. that they've got to enforce, all these tariffs that they've got to enforce, taxes on garlic and everything else that they have to enforce. You know, what are they getting out of it? They're getting nothing but grief, uh, grief from Brussels, who, who wants to levy financial transaction taxes on, on, uh, on stock tr- transactions that uh, uh, come from London. And uh, Cameron's resisting that. He ought to just put this whole thing to a vote. I think the people mm-hmm. in the UK, if it pushed come to shove, if they had the chance to vote, they would vote to exit the EU, as they should. And uh, I think we ought to have votes in a lot of places. Yeah. We ought to have a vote in Spain. We ought to have a vote in Italy. You know, what are the people getting out of this? What are they getting out of belonging in the Eurozone? They're getting nothing but grief. Uh, they need to default on the debt. And, and until they do that, and until they say they're going to walk away, uh, Spain is going to be in an economic depression. Certainly depressing news uh, this week for uh, uh, French President Francois Hollande. He has uh, uh, sunk in the popularity polls to a new low, Mish, 24%. And, and rather than being a man about this and taking the blame, he, he's <laughs> passing the buck here. Well, he is, yes. He, uh, he, he said he's going to hold his, what, finance members, cabinet <laughs> members accountable. Uh, I, that struck me as being really odd. You know, how much legislation... Does his finance minister pass or even have part of? You know, the if anything, it's the Socialist Party of Iran himself. He is the one that's gotten the French Parliament to pass these uh, laws that he's wanted. He's the one reaping results, and he's blaming his cabinet. He appointed him. Why doesn't he blame himself? Yeah. So the whole thing makes no sense. And um, pretty soon we're going to realize, and, and actually I posted on it a few months ago, I said that France is no longer part of core of Europe. The core of Europe is down to Germany. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when the markets finally realize this, that there is no cohesion. There is no mm-hmm. plan. Th- 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 there is nothing but bickering. France wants something different than what Italy wants, different from what Germany wants, different from what Netherlands wants, different from what Finland wants. So, you know, they all have this nebulous idea that we're all going to live together and be one happy family. Yet, when push comes to shove, Germany does not want to give money to Greece, doesn't want to give money to Portugal, doesn't want to give money to Spain. Spain is fighting with France over agricultural policies. Everyone is actually fighting with France over agricultural policies because they're extremely protectionist. So they all pretend that this is one big United States of Europe, Mm -hmm. but it isn't. It looks good on paper. It looks good on paper. It doesn't look good in practice. And the euro 
is one of the things that has crucified Southern Europe. It's, it, it, it crucified uh, Greece, it crucified Cyprus, it crucified Portugal, it crucified Spain. And yet all of these politicians have staken their careers, in, especially and including Angela Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, you, you know, that the Eurozone won't splinter on their watch. So they're all hell-bent to keep this thing going, no matter how much the citizens of their respective countries suffer. And that is exactly what's happening, and that's one of the things uh, uh, Nigel Farage um, uh, hollers about every time he gets the chance yeah. in European Parliament. He's on the right side of this thing. This thing is going to eventually blow up, and the sooner they dissolve this thing and the sooner they figure out how to how to untangle this mess, the problem is they're not going to do it, so it's going to splinter piecemeal, and it's going to be a very disastrous breakup, in my opinion. Mish, what are you working on? What's coming up next for you? Oh, I'm just trying to uh, uh, keep up with all of the inane practices <laughs> going on in, in Europe. I was reading another article that I've not written about yet, where uh, the, they're complaining. The Eurocrats here in, in, in Brussels, they want everyone in Europe to go on this, you know, solar energy, keck, or uh, efficient energy, uh, non-carbon-based energy. Uh-oh. So, so China's delivering these solar panels, and they're delivering, and then they're complaining. Oh, my gosh, China's delivering these things at a far cheaper rate than we are, and so it's bankrupting our, our <laughs> uh, companies. So they want to impose a 140 or was it 240 percent tax of on course. The solar panels coming from China. So what is it that they want, Phil? Do they do they want do they really want clean energy, or do they just say that they want clean energy, or or is it they want clean energy, but they want people to pay through the nose for it? It just seems Whatever like they want. Is they're hypocrites? Yeah. You know if. If clean energy was such the big overriding goal that many of these guys say it is, why? What could be better than if China supplied solar panels yes. for free? Yeah. So um, <laughs> these are the kind of inane rules and regulations that uh, uh, are being imposed upon businesses in the Eurozone, actually in the entire EU, yeah. on uh, the UK as well. And the sooner that people break away from this nonsense, the better off they will all be. More madness from the Eurozone next time we talk to uh, Mike Shadlock from Global Economic Analysis. Blogspot.com. Mish, always fun. Thanks for your time, sir. My pleasure. Thanks to our guests, Marin Katusa and Mike Shadlock. And thank you for listening. I'm Phil Mackesy. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.